As you can see, this nail is glowing red hot inside the induction heater. That means the induction heater is working just fine. Tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner, tanner, tech, tanner, tech, tanner. Hello, this is Tanner Tech. Have you ever wanted to heat a piece of ferrous metal using only the power of electromagnetism alone? Well, if you wanted to do that, this is the video for you. Because we're going to be learning how to build an induction heater and how it works. Now to start, let's take a look at the circuit. Now I think looking at the circuit and understanding how it works is one of the most important parts behind building an electronics project. Because you can download any schematic off the internet and build it, but you won't learn anything. So I'd like to teach you how this circuit works before we actually start building it. So what happens in this circuit is the current flows through here and through one of these resistors into the gates of one of these MOSFETs. Now because no resistor is perfect, the current's going to flow first into one of the MOSFETs, turning it on. So let's say, for example, it turns this MOSFET on first. So when this turns on, that draws this point in the MOSFET to a virtual ground, because it flows through here into ground. Now what that means is that this fast diode will short the base or gate of this MOSFET all the way back to ground, which will effectively shut this MOSFET off and make it so it can't turn on. Now when this MOSFET is on, it allows current to flow through one of these inductors, through this big coil down here, and into this resonant circuit capacitor bank into ground. Now what happens is, if in a resonant circuit, if you give it a spike of electricity, it'll go back and forth in this sine wave motion between the inductor and the capacitor. So if we imagine the, the x-axis, the point will start at positive, and then as soon as it turns on the gate, that point will go down to ground almost immediately. Now as soon as it hits ground, it's going to start resonating because we gave it that much energy. And so the circuit's going to start resonating. When it goes negative, that's going to pull this gate even more negative, so it's not really going to do anything. It's going to go to ground, and it's not going to do anything, and it's going to go up to positive. Now, once this point is at a positive potential, then this diode's not going to be doing work anymore. But the thing is, that'll make this point at a negative potential, which will ground the gate of this MOSFET, effectively shutting it off. Now, when this MOSFET is off, and this diode is no longer doing anything to this MOSFET, the current will flow through this resistor into this MOSFET, turning it on, which will make sure that this turns on, and it will start the cycle resonating all over again. These two, or four components right here, are just to protect the gates of the MOSFET. Now what happens is when we have that rapidly fluctuating electromagnetic field in this work coil right here, then that'll create eddy currents in whatever you're trying to induction heat. Now an eddy current is kind of like a normal electronic current. So let's say I have a nail, and I'm going to make this a pretty big nail right here. Now what happens is when there's an electromagnetic field surrounding it, it's going to cause small currents to flow through here, and these currents are like little circles inside it. And since there's these little tiny currents that are flowing into the metal, or just around it, it'll cause it to heat up, because resistance makes things heat up. And that will cause this whole entire piece of metal to heat up. Of course, the most important part of any project is the parts you'll need to build it. So right here I have a capacitor bank made of 10.47 microfarad capacitors in this cool flux capacitor format. I've got two fast diodes, two 10K resistors, two uh, 470 ohm resistors, and two 12 volt zener diodes. I also have two IRF250 MOSFETs, uh, my work coil which is made of a coat hanger, I have a heat sink, and I have my two inductors that go into it. These inductors are just computer power supply inductors with some wire wrapped around them. Each of these is 140 microhenries. So to get all these components, I'll just go to my component drawer and find them. So I need a 10K resistor. I'll just open it up. There are my 10K resistors. I need an IRF250 MOSFET. There we go. I got a bunch of them. Now I got all these components from LCSC. Now if you need to get any components for your project, go to lcscomponents.com or just lcsc.com and you can find all the components you'll need for your project. For example, these transistors or MOSFETs were only about 50 cents. It's a really good price. You can find the links to all these parts that I used in my project in the description from lcsc.com. Let's get started by mounting these transistors to the heatsink. So the first step you need to do is you need to build this thing. Alright, now that the tank circuit is all finished up, it's time to start wiring 
the actual oscillator circuit. So what we're going to do is we're going to first tin all of the pins of all of the MOSFETs. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take this wire, which is the ground wire for the whole circuit, and we're going to attach that to both of the ground pins, which are both of the sources of the MOSFETs. We're then going to take the Zener diodes and the 10K resistors. We're going to twist the two ends together because these go the same place. So just twist them together and solder them. You can then take your newly soldered 10K resistor and Zener diode, and as according to the circuit diagram, you need to connect the, the negative end of the Zener diode to the gate of each MOSFET. So kind of like this. Then, each of these Zener diode and resistors need to be grounded. So what you need to do is you need to bend each pair, so that way the other end can go to the ground lead of this whole circuit. The ground lead is pin 3. There we go. You're going to want to solder this diode to the source of the opposite MOSFET, which means you need to bend it and have it go to the opposite MOSFET source. Okay, so now after these two diodes are installed, you're going to want to run a resistor going from each of the gates of the MOSFETs into the uh, resistors and then have that go to a positive source voltage. There we go. Now these can be tied together. Now that this circuit is pretty much done, all that's left is to connect the work coil, your uh, capacitor bank and inductors, and your little circuit together. So first what we're going to do is we're going to connect the work coil to these two uh, leads of this capacitor bank. After the work coil is connected to the capacitor bank, you can then start to connect the uh, work coil and tank circuit to the MOSFETs. So you can do this by connecting one side of the work coil to the source of one MOSFET. I mean the drain, sorry. You can then connect all the other parts together by connecting the uh, positive or middle part of the tank circuit to the part of the two resistors and then to your positive power supply and the other side of your coil and your tank circuit to the other source or I mean drain. Alright, so with that, our induction heating setup is all done. Everything is wired together according to the schematic, and everything is connected. So, we have the two MOSFETs, resistors and Zener diodes, two resistors to supply the gates, we have the tank circuit with the two uh, inductors, we've got the work coil, we've got everything wired. Here are two power wires. I say we test this thing out. Now it's time to test this induction heater out with this screw. Now you have to make, use ferrous metals, which means metals that can stick to magnets. So what I'll do is I will fire this up with my RV power converter power supply. Then I'll insert this nail or screw into the work coil with this. And hopefully it should start heating up and glowing red. Hopefully. Here we go. Made in trial. Let's hope it doesn't erupt in some black smoke. There we go. Oh, oh, something happened. It smoked. Okay, now attempting test two. New MOSFETs, new diodes, and a new capacitor placement. Here we go. Too much current. Something's wrong. Okay, undergoing the next test. Three, two, one. Dang it. Okay, now it's time for test run five or six or seven or one high test run. Well, anyway, I've already blown out two MOSFETs. And I really hope I don't blow out another one. Here we go. Three, two, one. Dang it. Okay. I think this is what? My seventh trial? Probably? Well, anyway, I realized that one of these MOSFETs was dead shorted across all the pins. So that's three MOSFETs that are completely blown up, plus another MOSFET that's completely dead shorted. I replaced both MOSFETs. Hopefully it'll work now. Three, two, one. Well, alrighty now, so this is my next attempt at building a ZVS driver, uh, induction heater. As you can see, I've redone the circuit board almost completely, so everything is pretty much new, and I've double checked all the connections, everything should be fine. 
I have my uh, oscilloscope probe hooked up here so that way I can see if it actually starts oscillating. Three, two, one. There we go. I think it worked. Okay, now for a test run where you have all these different instruments telling us everything. So this multimeter right here is going to be saying the input voltage of the induction heater. This one is going to say the current it's drawing. The oscilloscope is measuring the frequency of the induction heater through this uh, little coil right here. That's going to receive the frequency and tell us what it is. And uh, that's just about it. Everything's all hooked up. Three, two, one, go. There you go. 11.3 volts, 14.3 amps. You can see it has a funky little frequency on that screen there. But it works. Okay, it's time to start up the induction heater, see how well it works. Now I finally figured out how to make this induction heater work properly. Now before it was drawing about 14 amps just idling, and that's not good because that's way too many amps. That was causing the MOSFETs to overheat, it was causing everything to overheat. But I've actually figured out what the issue with that problem is, and that was the coil. And I think that this coil being a ferrous material was causing the eddy currents that were supposed to be induced into the object you want to heat up to be induced into the coil itself, which caused it to heat up. Now, I think that's what was the problem because I used a copper coil and it worked fine instead of the steel one. Now, let's take a look at this induction heater in action. As you can see, when I fire it up, it draws about 3.2 amps when there's nothing inside it. And if let's say I enter a screwdriver into it, it jumps all the way up to like 5.5 amps. So the current draw changes depending on if there's an object inside the induction heater. Let's try and heat up some stuff. As you can see, this nail is glowing red hot inside the induction heater. That means the induction heater is working just fine. It's heating up this nail to red hot almost instantaneously. I guess my alligator clip leads weren't meant to take that much current, and they decided to start melting and smoking and almost catch fire. So, I'm going to take this whole thing, I'm going to shrink it down into a, a smaller device on a piece of wood. Right now it's being powered by the power supply for my other ZVish driver too. Alright, finally, so after maybe a week and a half of building and experimenting, I finally got my induction heater so that way it'll work. So this is the final project. It's mounted on a piece of wood, and as you can see, this is the coil in front that is the work coil. Now this is being powered by two sealed lead acid batteries, and I've got a multimeter right here that reads out the current draw that this is drawing, because the current draw actually changes as it starts heating up something. So let's turn this on and see what it can do. Okay, so with no further ado, I'll set this multimeter right here and we'll see that nail heat up. There we go. You should probably see that nail heating up really quick. As you can see the current draw goes up. And there you go. The nail is glowing red hot. Okay, let's watch that again in uh, somewhat dark. That thing just glows red hot. And if I take it out, you can see that it still is glowing red, but it cools off, and the current draw drops a lot. Alright, now let's try putting a paper clip inside here to see how fast we can heat this up. Here we go. There we go. It's drying 2.9 amps. I'll stick it in, and this is real time. Look at how fast that heated up. That's real time heating. It's also kind of fun to use the induction heater to heat up resistors. Put a resistor inside there. It'll start smoking first of all. And then it'll start glowing. Look at that. That induction heater just fried that resistor to a crisp. Let's try heating up a whole side of a paper clip. Well, 
that is my final product of my induction heater. And as you can see, it's pretty cool and it's pretty fun to play with, especially to heat up little pieces of metal to glowing red hot in a matter of seconds. Thank you to my sponsor, LCSC Components, for supplying all the parts that I use to make this project. <laughs> it takes a long time to design a product, and sometimes it doesn't work. And it didn't work probably the first five times, which made me go through quite a few MOSFETs, uh, diodes, and resistors. But that's fine, because that's how you learn. So, good luck to anyone out there who wants to build their own induction heater. And always remember, when you make your work coil, never make it out of ferrous materials. Always make it out of copper. So, if you want to build one of these things, check out the description. You'll see some links to LCSC components where you can buy all the components that I use in this project. They're super high quality. As always, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for next time.